right, if you have your Bibles with you, we'd ask you to turn to the 73rd Psalm, Psalm 73, and we're going to begin reading in verse 22. Uh, Psalm 73 and uh, verse 22. Psalm 73 and uh, verse uh, 22, the Bible says, So foolish was I and ignorant. I was as a beast before thee. Nevertheless, I am continually with thee. Thou hast holden me by my right hand. Thou shalt guide me with thy counsel, and afterward receive me to glory. Whom have I in heaven but thee? There is none upon the earth that I desire beside thee. My flesh and my heart fainteth, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. For lo, they are far from thee. For lo, they are far from thee shall perish. Thou hast destroyed all them that go a-whoring from thee, but it is good for me to draw near to God. I have put my trust in to, the, to God. I have put my trust in the Lord God that I may declare thy works. I'll be preaching this morning on the thought it's good to be near God. Dear Lord, we thank you, we praise you, and give you great glory and honor for who you are, for simply resting on the throne and having all this place beneath your feet. Lord, we don't understand all things, but we know that you've made them, so they must be good for us. Lord God, we pray this morning that you would open your word to us, that you'd give us deceiving hearts, Lord, that you'd walk in and among your people, and we pray these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. Now, uh, we're reading from a psalm or a song of Asaph, and he was one of the chief musicians, and uh, he began uh, to understand a little bit about the more, a little bit more about the human condition than most of us ever get to, because uh, we really don't want to see ourselves in this light. He begins where we're going to begin in verse 22, so foolish was I. Now, the natural state of man when it comes into spiritual things is we're foolish. Uh, we do not want to see ourselves that way. We don't want to perceive ourselves, but we're foolish when we come uh, in spiritual things. It's foolish that you believe that you can approach God. It, it is foolish for you to dream up some way to be saved in and of yourself. That's foolish. Uh, it, it's crazy. And, and the psalmist here, Asaph, began to realize how, how foolish he had been in the ways that he had thought about God. You know what? And the biggest thing we'll find from Asaph is this, that he found it foolish to stay away from God. And, and that is a very foolish thing, and, and God's people can be there. You don't have to be lost to be far from God. And, and most of us spend the majority of our spiritual life in a distance that's further from God than we should be comfortable with. Amen. So foolish was I and ignorant. Now to be ignorant... Uh, foolish is you're just uh, you're you're just uh, not where you need to be, and you don't take seriously the things of God. But ignorance is that you just don't know. Uh, you know what? What we need to do is know that book and know it inside and out, and not be ignorant. And don't you go on what somebody has told you and what mother and daddy has said about it. You get in that book and you find out for yourself and then you can't say you're ignorant. You know what? If you just believe what I tell you, you're still ignorant. And, and so we need to get in that book ourselves and dig and, and, and just soak up a much, as much of it as you possibly can. So foolish was I and ignorant. I was as a beast before thee. 
Now, when you think of a beast, it's uncontrolled. It's not. It, it's not. It's not been broken. Uh, uh, our cows at home, they they are uh, they are unbroken beasts. They do, and they're just wild. And, and that is a beast, a natural state of rebellion. Now, Augustine's horse is different. He's a little broken. Uh, you can pet him on the nose. He doesn't like me, but he likes Donna. And, and, and you can kind of deal with Sakura different because he's not wild. He's been broken, son. We, as the Lord's people, we're like the cats. We're wild. We're, we're naturally against uh, being tamed down. And that's what Asaph was saying here is that uh, that he was uh, he was in this condition uh, uh, of being uh, of being a beast before God. Verse twenty three. Nevertheless, I am continually with thee. Now that's a wonderful mouthful, and that's a wonderful thing to say. And I wonder if Asaph was just singing that. Or if he really meant it. You know, we sing, oh, how I love Jesus. And we sing it together and we sing it with praise. But do you really love Jesus? See, I, I don't know if these were words on the page to Asaph or he really meant them. But what a wonderful thing if he could really mean it and truly say it. I'm continually with you. Most of us cannot. Most of us don't have that ability to say, Lord, I'm by your side. Lord, I'm with you on a continual basis. I'm there. Nevertheless, I'm continually, continually with thee. Thou hast holden me by my right hand. Now, that's a wonderful thing, too. Uh, the Lord God, the Lord Jesus is guiding us. And it says right here by the right hand. Now, I want you to think about and, and, and set your dates for the living part of Asaph's life. And it was before the Lord Jesus Christ manifested himself as man. And I'm not sure about the Holy Ghost. So was he talking about the Lord God Almighty? He says, he's right here beside me holding my hand. You know what? The next time you get in trouble, the next time things look bleak, the next time the money's out, you remember this. If you're in the will of God, he's right there beside you. In, in, in the church years, I believe that's the Holy Ghost. Uh, from, from what I can learn from the Bible, but whatever person of the Godhead is there, he's at your right hand, and he's there for your benefit, he's there for your help. And so Asaph had a good understanding, and we'll see that this was worthwhile. Uh, uh, something's worthwhile when you're ready to give time to it. Something's worthwhile when the effort that you put in, that the goal is worth what you're doing. You know what? Uh, you know why a lot of times we don't put any more into serving the Lord than we do? We don't enjoy that, that friendship when he's on your right side. That fellowship when he's there. You know, uh, uh, we need to enjoy the fellowship of the Lord. Yeah. And, and I don't know that we always do. You, you know why we don't sometimes? It's because he's come to rebuke us. He's come to straighten us out a little bit. And, and the flesh never likes this. Verse 24. Thou shalt guide me <laughs> with thy counsel. Now there's two ways. Now counsel... It, it goes a little bit more than reading. Uh, when you counsel somebody, I know uh, when I was young, when mom counseled me, it went it went a lot more than a good weapon. Because when you counsel somebody, it goes like this, Larry. If you keep doing what you what you're doing right now, this is the result. If you keep going in the direction you are right now, you're going to be far from God. If you keep doing the things you're doing, the Lord is not going to bless you. That is good counsel. It's telling you the end result of your present actions. Now, uh, I'll give you a good example. And, and it goes like this. Uh, you can hear the all, all the preaching you want to, but if you're not listening, the end result is rebellion. Amen. 
And, and, and so we as the Lord's people, we, we have a, a wonderful counselor and a friend in the person of the Lord. Thou shalt guide me with thy counsel, and afterward receive me to glory. Now, I want you to see that Asaph and his son had this assurance that he would be with the Lord. You'll receive me to glory. Now, in that day and in that point in history, that was Abraham's bosom. And you know what? Uh, we don't understand everything about that historic place and where it was at. But I do know this. It was a wonderful place to be. Now, it's not as good as heaven, but there was comfort there. There was pleasantries there for those people. There was fellowship. And, and, and so we, we as the Lord's people, the, the, the thing that we need to focus on is where are you going to be? What's going to be the end result? And you know what? Blaming God for being sovereign is no excuse for your spiritual condition. You, you know, how foolish, if you're far from the Lord this morning, how foolish for you to blame God. Yeah. If you're not saved this morning, how foolish to blame God. Right. Because the Bible says, seek ye the Lord while he may be found. Amen. You know what? When you stand before him one day, that's no excuse. Right. It isn't. Uh, and, and so we as Lord's people, we ought to be able to praise him and, and give him great glory for the comforts that, that he provides. Whom have I in heaven but thee? Now, the psalmist Asaph was, was looking to the Lord God, I believe, and, and what he knew about God the Son and what he may have knew, knew about the Holy Ghost, he says, I know you're there in heaven. Uh, answer that question for me this morning. Who have I in heaven? Now, the two that I have in heaven is the person of the Lord Jesus Christ and the Lord God Almighty, that great God Jehovah. That's who I have in heaven. Isn't that a wonderful thing? You know, when you begin to think about who have I in heaven, you know, don't think about your grandparents and don't think about mama and daddy. Who do you have in heaven? The only advocate, the only person saying he's mine is the Lord Jesus Christ himself. That's who I have in heaven. You know, my grandparents and my great-grandparents and my great-great-grandparents, this is the truth. I can't speak for them. But I know I, have, I know I have two in heaven, and that's God the Father, and His right hand is the Lord Jesus Christ. That's who I have in heaven. And, and, and if you don't have assurance of that this morning, uh, you certainly can. Uh, you certainly have the possibility for that to be. Whom have I in heaven but thee? And there is none upon the earth that I desire beside thee. Oh, what a wonderful condition it would be uh, this morning if we could get like that. I don't care about the rest of the world. I desire to be with thee. You know what? Uh, it's a wonderful, wonderful thing to have grandchildren. I have all four of mine here this morning. And, and, and you really, when you have children, you think, hey, this is the greatest love there's ever been. And then you have grandchildren, and it's better still. But, could you get to the point that you could set that aside and say, I want to desire to be with God. You know what? In the flesh, that's a very, very difficult thing to do. And, and you only, I don't know if you're about like me, but I'm sure you are, really you only get glimpses here and there. I, I've never stayed in a state very long. I don't know about you, but I haven't. Where all I wanted was God. And, and, and so we as the Lord's people, that ought to be our strive. And Asaph saw it just this way. That the important thing, all I want, all I desire, all I feel for is to be, is to be beside thee. My flesh and my heart Faith. Now, if you don't get nothing else out of the sermon this morning, get that one. Because why was he saying that? 
Asaph wasn't dying. At least I don't think he was. My flesh fails at approaching God. My heart, the spirit man, it fails at approaching God. And so we have to begin to say, hey, it, it, we, th this is a completely soul, spiritual thing. You can't approach God with your flesh. And, and, and you know, that's what's so cumbersome to people that don't understand grace. Is you can't approach Him in the flesh. You know, uh, I know there's churches so called out there. And, and they come in at worship time. And maybe sometimes they're a little bit more worshipful than we are. I don't know. But you know what? They come in and I, I've heard of them dancing and carrying on. You know what? That's not, I don't care how well they dance, that's not approaching God. I'm not saying necessarily it's anything wrong with it. I, I don't see it in the New Testament, I'll put it that way. And when the big dancing David did, he got clobbered for it, right? And, but, if it's okay, if that was an Old Testament thing and the Jews did it, fine. But you're still in the flesh. You're still in the flesh. And, and, and so we, as the Lord's people, uh, remember that in the flesh, you can't approach God. You have to set this thing aside. But God is the strength of my heart. So if you're going to approach God, it has to be with the strength of God. If you're going to approach Him and get to this nearness that Asaph desired, that you're going to have to do it through the power of the Almighty. And it, the Bible says here, in the strength of God. What does it say about John, the apostle, on Patmos? I was in the spirit on the Lord's day. See, he was in the strength of God. What does it say at times, and, and not just on Pentecost, don't, don't get like that, because there were other times, they were full of the Holy Ghost, right? You know what, that's some strength, is it not? You know, that, that's how they approached God, was it not? And so, we're going to have to get outside our boxes and realize if we want to spend time with God, We'll be through him. And since the Holy Ghost is our agent at the presence of the of the triune God, he's going to have to be with him. He is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. For lo, they that are far from thee shall perish. Now that word means die. So, you know what, and, and I, I know of a few maybe, first of all, if you live your life like a dog, your whole life like a dog, uh, you probably lost. But, you know, uh, this one, the way that I understand this one, that there's an abiding that's far from God, but you won't last there long because the Bible says here you'll perish, you'll die, you'll end up dead. And, and so... We see that Asaph makes it very clear there's a place far from God and there's a place close to God. Now, the question is this morning, which are you in? Nothing, nothing easier, nothing more important could ever be answered because apparently Asaph knew it. And you can know the, question, the answer to that question as well. Are you near or are you far? Are you close or are you somewhere else? You know, uh, after 25 years of preaching, I can tell when people are plugged in and when they're not. And when they have that day's glare, you know they're far from you. Yeah. And, and, and that's exactly as the Lord's people here. His desire was to be close. The ones that were far away were going to perish. The rest of verse 27 says... Thou hast destroyed all them that go a whoring from thee, but it is good for me to draw near to God. Now, I want you to notice two things. That way we can't excuse us 
or excuse ourselves because of God's sovereignty. He says it is good to me, it is good for me to be near to God. You know what the most wonderful thing it is this morning? If you're near to God, if you're close up to Him, if you can, you remember, remember uh, uh, the, the, the apostle laid his head on the Lord's breast and said, Lord is God. Man, you know why he could do that? He was close to Christ. See, Peter was across the table, and Peter didn't say that. Well, he did at the end, but it makes me wonder, did he say that because everybody else was saying it? But we find John leaning against the Lord's breast was the first one to say, Lord, is it I? Am I going to betray you? And the reason he did is because he was close to the Lord. And, and, and my question to you this morning is how closely are you abiding to him? Because that's where we as the Lord's people ought to desire to be. For it is good for me to draw near to God. I have put my trust in the Lord God that I may declare all my works. Now, I want you to see there was a result in Asaph's life from living and abiding near God, and it was that he could declare his works. Now, I, I personally don't believe that Asaph was declaring his works historically, like such as, uh, you know, the Lord God created the heavens and earth by simply speaking them. That was a wonderful work, was it not? But I don't believe that was what Asaph was talking about. The Lord God Almighty preserved Noah and his family from the great flood because of his goodness and mercy. Uh, wonderful truth, but I don't think that's what Asaph was talking about. I think Asaph knew it personally. The Lord God saved my unworthy soul. He provided for me when I had nothing. See, personal experience. When you're that close to the Lord, you'll begin to have some personal experiences. And it don't have to be that he led you through hardships. It can be, you know, I remember one morning when I was studying and praying that the Spirit came so near to me that I've never quite been the same since. Those were the type Asaph was sharing. And he had the ability because he was close unto the Lord. And so again, I ask you this morning, how close, how near are you to the Almighty, to the Holy Ghost? Because that is, that, that is the one question that you must answer. That is the one thing that's the most important. Uh, look with me in Psalms 19, just a little further back. Psalms 19. In uh, verse 7. Psalms 19 and verse 7. The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul... The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. Now, I want you to see here that always, always remember this. Even though we stumble and we fall over it, the law is always good. And the reason the law is always good, it tells us where our sin is. The Bible says in the New Testament, Paul, I think, writing... Uh, to the churches of Corinth, the church at Corinth says the law was our schoolmaster. A schoolmaster tells you where you're wrong. A schoolmaster teaches you. And, and once he or she teaches you, uh, if you write down that Abraham Lincoln was the first president of the United States, She'll put a big red X on there and, what, and right beside it, George Washington. Because it was our schoolmaster. A schoolmaster doesn't pat you on the back when you've messed up. You know, th th this one thing stands out in my mind when I was teaching nursing. I, I told a student to get up, get her things together, and get out that door. And you know why? I was a good schoolmaster. You know what that girl needed to learn is respect. 
And the only way that she would learn respect is to come under somebody. Mm -hmm. And I'll guarantee you she'd not been under, uh, she had not met anybody just like me before. But you know what? In the long run, it was good for her. Mm -hmm. In fact, toward the end, she came to me and said, Mr. Lafferty, I'm sorry how I acted at the beginning of the year. And see, that's how it's supposed to work. A schoolmaster will tell you what's the truth, and then he'll tell you when you're wrong. Mm -hmm. and, and so we as the Lord's people, we need to understand that, that if we're going to rejoice in closeness, we have to have this outlined before and understand what it means. Um, Isaiah chapter 6. Isaiah chapter 6, and we're just going to read verse 10. Uh, for uh, for time's sake, Isaiah chapter 6 and verse 10, the Bible says this, Make the heart of the people fat. Now, I want you to see, this is kind of an unusual uh, reading. That heart doesn't mean the pump that keeps us alive this morning. It means the soul of man and he says, I want you to make that part fat. I want you to make the soul fat. Now, why would he possibly want the soul to be fat? Well, I'll give you a couple of, uh, a couple of uh, things about fatty flesh and how it applies to the heart. You know what? Fatty flesh, when, you, when you're a heavy person, it doesn't feel, it don't have the, the nerve that muscle has. When you have thin skin and you get a little pinprick, it hurts because it almost immediately goes into muscle. Now, when you're insulated by a big balmy fat, it's going to hurt when you get poked. But you know what? It's not going to do much damage because it hasn't hit anything. You see what I'm saying? You're so insulated by that fat layer, it never gets to the core. Now, as Isaiah is writing here, we find that the Lord God Almighty, that's what he wanted for Israel. I want them to be a fat people. And why? I don't want them to hear. Make the heart of this people fat. Make their ears heavy and shut their eyes lest they see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their heart and convert and be healed. Now, I want you to see this word in, in verse uh, convert. Now, I've seen that during my life used for salvation. That is not what that means. Convert means to change. And he is saying here, I'm going to give them an insulation so they don't change. I'm going to get them where they can't hear, and I'm going to get them where they can't see, and I'm going to get them where they can't feel the Word of God, and they're not going to change. Now, the question is this. If we're really hearing this morning, and we want to be like the psalmist Asaph, if you hear something with your spiritual ear, are you going to change? Or are you going to stay where you're at? And I'm not talking about uh, theologians. You know, everybody is all, and, and I understand that Spurgeon wrote some good things, but you know what? Spurgeon wasn't a prophet, and he did not write scripture. And so, the end result is this. If you got ideas that came from Spurgeon but didn't come from the Bible, you've got to convert. Right? And, and so we as the Lord's people, sometimes what we think is right and what we've been told is right is not right. And when we find that, we've got to convert. We've got to align ourselves with Scripture and Scripture alone. Matthew chapter 18. Gospel of Matthew uh, chapter 18. And we're just going to read uh, verse 3 uh, for time's sake. Matthew 18, in verse 3, the Bible says this, the Lord Jesus Christ speaking, Whosoever shall humble himself as this little child, the same is greatest 
in the kingdom of heaven. Now, I, I want you to get this because a lot of people miss the whole point of the little child. Now, if Bella was awake, I could say, Bella, come here. And she would come. And you know why? She obeys her daddy's voice. That's the number one thing about coming as a child is that they obey. They're, they're obedient beings. Now, if you've trained them right, now, if you've let them be a rebel and they've never been corrected, they're the other end of the spoke and, they'll, and, and, and they come out as something else. But an obedient child is what the Lord is saying here. They're, they're obedient. Now, the other thing about a young, obedient child, it could be a balmy day, 70, 80 degrees, sunshine. Bella, it's going to snow tonight. And you know what? She's believing it. The belief of a little child. That's what we're to be. If you look in that book and it says anything, believe it. Just believe it. You don't have to question it. You don't have to have a backup scripture from here to Clarksville. Just believe it. Just take it for what it says. You know what? The Bible says if we have the faith as a grain of mustard seed and say, mountain, be thou removed, it will be. Now, what I've heard all my life, now that's not really talking about a mountain. That means problems in your life. You know what I think about? I think it means mountains just like the Smoky Mountains in East Tennessee. And if we had faith to say, mountain, be thou removed, that that become a flat plain over the Smoky Mountains. Because that is faith. And, and you know why we don't like to hear about it like that? We want to say, oh, it's troubles in your life. Because we know we don't have the faith to say, mountain, be removed. Yeah, yeah. We, we know we don't. <laughs> and, and so we, as the Lord's people, if you want to come in... And be converted, you have to come with faith as a little child. That, that no matter what God says, you're going to take him at his word. The Gospel of Luke, chapter 22. Luke 22 and verse 32. Luke 22 and verse 32. The Lord Jesus speaking to Peter... And he had just told Peter that he was like Satan. Or, excuse me, that Satan wanted him. But know what the Lord says. But I have prayed for thee, meaning Peter, I have, but I have prayed for thee that thy faith fail not. And when thou art converted, strengthen the brethren. Now, I want you to know that can't be salvation because he was saved in Matthew 16, verse 18, when the Lord Jesus said, Whom do ye say that I am? And he said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Right? So what did he mean conversion on? Two things, I think. First of all, Peter was a big Ike. Was he not? Oh, Lord, let us build three tabernacles here. I will never leave thee. Remember? And the cup fell in love. See, this is the thing. The Lord knows you better than you know yourself. Right? Yeah. And, and, and so we find in, in, in this writing, what Peter needed to be changed is genuine. That he needed to back up what he'd been saying. And I want you to see, the Lord said, Peter, I prayed for thee that thy faith fail not. But let me ask you this. Didn't it? I think it did. I'm not saying that the Lord was incapable of prayer. But you know, the Lord's prayers, every one of them was not granted. Did you ever think about that? Lord, if this cup... Uh, uh, if this cup, cup if, if thou willest, let this cup pass from me. Remember? But it didn't. 
did. And so he says, Peter, I pray that thy faith will fail not. But you know what? Peter's faith fell. I don't know what you're talking about. I've never even met the man. Remember? Wouldn't you say that that, that was fallen faith? And for our little Church of Christ people and stuff like that out there, it didn't make him lost again. His faith fell. And you know what? Your faith fails too. You get down and discouraged and get the huzzy drugs. Sometimes, if you'd be honest, you would even say, Lord, why are we even here? You know why you're here this morning? In this place, living in 2019, is because God spoke it that way. Yeah. You know, I, I, I've read of the Great Awakenings in the late 1700s and then about the 1830s again. You know what? That's good history. But that's what it is, is history. Yeah. And, and, and so we as the Lord's people, uh, we need to simply say it. Is there an area in my life that needs changing? Is there an area in my life where I don't line up? Is there an area in my life where my faith is failing me? And if you be honest, you'll find some. If you be real honest, you'll find areas where your faith is weak. And you know what? And, and, and this, I, I'm not bragging, but I'm giving you an example. You know where mine used to be? Money. It really was. Money was my issue. And that's hard to believe because I don't have a lot of money. But that just goes to show you don't have to, you don't have, to have a lot of money uh, to be a Pharisee, do you? You don't have to have a lot of money to trust your money. But when I really finally saw that the Lord is my provider is when I quit the school and just went and preached because I knew that's what God needed. And you know what? It added to my level of faith. That, that is the faith of a child, is it not? I really left without a job. I didn't get hired somewhere else until I got back. <laughs> right? So where is your faith at? Are you believing like a child? <laughs> Are you believing with all those questions that come up in the adult human mind? Which one are you believing like? And so we as the Lord's people, we certainly, every work, every way we possibly can, need to come as a child. We need to come with belief. We need to, when, the Lord wants, when the Lord says, hey, you need converting on this area, just do it. Acts chapter 3. Acts chapter 3. Uh, in verse 19. Acts 3 and verse 19. Repent ye therefore and be converted that your sins may be blotted out when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. Now this is a very chalk full verse. Uh, Peter is preaching, he's preaching the gospel, and he tells these individuals, repent ye therefore. Now, if that don't sound familiar to you, let me remind you this, John the Baptist's first message was repent. The Lord Jesus Christ's first message was repent. And here we find Peter with his first real message that he, remember, Peter by this point had been converted. He had changed the things that were wrong in his life. And now he was preaching what? Simple repentance. Just simple, everyday repentance, just like John did, just like Jesus did. And now he's, re he's preaching just simple repentance. Repent ye therefore... And what? And be converted. Now, let me say this. You can't convert until you're sorry of it. Right. Yeah. Remember we, at our very beginning how Asaph was a little disgusted with himself? 
That, that, that's the same thing. When you find your wrong in the scriptures, does it not grieve you? It ought to. When, when you find you're in error and you've not aligned yourself with the word, if it don't repent, if it don't cause you to be sorry, something's dreadfully wrong. Something's bad. So he says when you see that, and he was talking to the Jews, by the way, his first sermon was to a big group of Jews. And you know what they needed repentance from? They had missed Christ. They had missed it altogether. And, and he says, I want you to repent and then be converted. You know what? Until they repented, they could not convert, if you will, to Christianity because they had never received, they had never seen Jesus. They did not see him as Messiah. They did not see him as King. And, and so he's saying, repent and then change that your sins may be blotted out from the time when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. Now, if you'll follow this on out, that did happen. And they said, what must we do to be saved? And in one place, I think in two, they said, we have, essentially, this is not the word, we've missed the Holy One. And the church at Jerusalem, at the end of that, grew by 3,000 souls in one day. Yeah. And you know what? The Lord wanted it that way, of course, first of all. But Paul, I mean, excuse me, Peter preached repentance. And that's exactly what we need in the modern day is simply repentance. And when you see something wrong, change it. When you see something that's not aligned with Scripture, Go with the scripture. Always go with scripture. James chapter 5 and verse 19. James 5 and verse 19. The Bible says, Brethren, if any of you do err from, from the truth, and one convert him. Now that is not speaking of Christ. That is not speaking of the Holy Ghost. That means one of us. That means me going to somebody and, and, and saying, you're messing up. Donna, you don't, need to, you don't need to be running around in britches. You see what I'm saying? And if Donna says, Larry, you're right. She's been converted. Not spiritually. I'm not saying saved. Her thoughts have been changed. She's aligned herself with that book. You see what I'm saying? And, and, and that's what we, as the Lord's people, as disciples, need to teach and preach when we see something amiss to tell them. Verse 20. Let him know that he which converted the sinner from the error of his way shall save a soul from death and shall hide a multitude of sins. Now, this morning I ask you this. Are you desirous enough to be near unto the Lord to convert? If you see something wrong in your life and, and you want it aligned with this book, are you willing to do it? This book and this alone. You know, there's a saying, and I'm not trying to bash other people, I'm really not, but there's a saying in the Seventh day Adventist people. The Bible and the Bible alone. Now, I don't agree probably with half of what they say. I wouldn't even say a third of what they say. But man, that's something to say, isn't it? The Bible and the Bible alone. Not what mama's taught you, not what some kind of book has taught you. Just this. We don't need anything else. We don't need commentaries. They're fine and they might explain. Expository just means explaining. But you know what? If they come up with a doctrine and it's not backed up with this book, we don't need it. The Bible 